The Gospel reading comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, beginning at verse 13, the walk to Emmaus. Hear these words. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what were you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Single-minded, wholehearted, is one thing I ask. Single-minded, wholehearted, is one thing I ask. That I may gaze upon your beauty, O Lord. That I may seek your holy face. That I may know you in an intimate way. To follow after you all of my days. Follow after you all of my days. Single-minded, wholehearted, this one thing I ask. A single-minded, wholehearted. There's one thing I ask That I may gaze upon your beauty, O Lord That I may seek your holy face That I may know you in an intimate way 
follow after you all of my days to follow after you all of my days cause all of life comes down to just one thing and that's to know you oh Jesus to make you known cause all of life comes down to just one thing that's to know you oh jesus to make you know sing that with me because all of life comes down to just one thing that's to know you oh jesus to make you known follow after you to follow after you all of my days to follow after you all of my days cause I want to know you amen thank you Maury and voices I called Maury at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. I said, hey, I need something else. I need a song in the middle of this thing so, you know, I can feel something beforehand. And he came through. So he, he always comes through for me. First of all, I want to say I'm so overwhelmed. I'm on the verge of tears because so many of the people in my life who have supported me for so long are here today. <laughs> and so I'm so grateful to be able to share with family and friends in our beloved community. Um, please pray with me. God, I pray that you increase, that your words fall fresh on open hearts and open minds so that your people will go forth and transform the world for Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts collectively together be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Y'all know I don't like standing behind that thing, so... That's why this music stand is here. I'm not going to sing. Maury knows I make a joyful noise unto the Lord that you all might not want to hear that the Lord appreciates sometimes. Happy Easter. I'm so glad y'all responded because we're going to talk a little bit more about Easter today. You know, there's more to the story that I did not know about. Clearly, you all know about the more that happens in Easter. I didn't. See, when I was growing up, Easter was that special Sunday where you got your press and curl and you had your pretty pink dress and there were colored eggs and there were chocolate bunnies and we went to church, even if we didn't go all year. Before I move forward, I'm gonna explain a press and curl because some people might not know. So a press and curl in the African-American community is when your mother sits you in front of the stove <laughs> with a hot comb. I still have the one my mother used. Well, this might be a newer one, it's only a little bit tarnished, and she would put it on hot fire until it was glowing, and then she would wave it around and blow it, and then press your, I don't have it anymore, but press your hair until it was straight, and then get another hot curler to make the smooth flowing curls for Easter Sunday. The rest of the time we wore ponytails and barrettes and all that stuff, but Easter was special. You got to hold your ears and hope you didn't get burned, right? So we would go to church on Easter, if not on any other Sunday, we would do that to celebrate the resurrection of our Christ. And then, if we did go back, because sometimes we went back for a couple more times so people wouldn't talk really bad about us and say we didn't go all year, it seems that the sermon stopped talking about Easter and that time, but started talking about fire and brimstone, or maybe you were lucky and you got a, a sermon about your big, living into your big dream, or something of that. But very rarely did you hear about the Easter season the time when Jesus revealed himself, his resurrected self, to his disciples over the course of several days, even weeks. And I encourage you as we move forward in the next few weeks not to stay stuck on that one Sunday because you just might miss the revelation of the risen Christ. So that's where we are. This is what brings us to our text. We often hear a text approach from Jesus' perspective or the disciples' perspective or what they saw, but 
I have a super duper analytical mind. Those who know me think that I think really hard about a lot of things. And I like to read in between the lines. I can't just look at what's going on and say, oh, that's it. That's what it was. So whether it's a movie or the Bible or a book, I read in between the lines. I put myself into the text and I wonder. I wonder what it looked like and meant to those involved. So I'm thinking about these disciples walking along this road. Their teacher, their companion, their friend is dead. And it was a brutal death. We've heard about it. We had Good Friday where we wept, and we know it was really brutal. And on the cross, when their friend died, their teacher died, their companion died, their hopes and dreams seemed to die right along with him. And while they had the prophecy, they were living in it in the moment. They didn't have the stories that we have. They didn't have the Bible to go back and the celebrations we have. They're in the midst of it and they had the prophecy. They knew what was said in the Torah as we know the Old Testament, but they couldn't see what was really happening. And for those of you who have read the Old Testament, you know the prophets said a lot of stuff and people never listened to them. And that's how they got in trouble, all the trouble they got into. So these are Jewish people who were like, yeah, the prophets said it, but could it really be? And so as we take our journey together, I encourage you to explore what this message means to us 2,000 years later. Have you ever had to ask yourself, do I know Jesus? Would I know Jesus? Or when we have our judgmental moments, do you know Jesus? And more importantly, when you are walking to Emmaus, your Emmaus road, we all have one. We'll talk about that. Do you know Jesus then? The text begins with a journey, a walk to Emmaus, not on Emmaus, but to Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place where the crucifixion took place. And it's the third day, and there were rumors that the tomb was found empty that morning. So it's been a few hours, but we're still on that day. They don't know about, oh, he rose in the morning. They just know they said the tomb was empty. But they went and he wasn't there, so we don't know. What did that really mean to these two disciples? They saw Jesus raise Lazarus, but could he raise himself? They saw Jesus heal other people, but could he really heal himself? Could someone come back from such a horrific death? Can't you imagine? You're walking, you've seen it, you've mourned all day Saturday. There's no way possible. Jesus had been buried and the funeral is over and now it's time to go home. And it's time to figure out what we're gonna do next without our friend, without our companion, without our teacher, the one who had shown us so many things. And as opposed to rejoicing like we do on Easter Sunday, they're grieving. They're in a state of hopelessness. Adam Hamilton, in his book, The Final Word, says, each one of us will one day walk our own road to Emmaus, a journey of grief, disappointment, a journey of pain. Can you identify your road to Emmaus experience? Some of you might have already had such a journey, just like the disciples having lost a loved one. But what if your Emmaus is a goal or a destination? A maze could be graduation and you're stalled on the road to graduation because of a failed class or because of a financial crisis at home or just crazy things going on and you just couldn't get it together. It's a hard experience. Emory was hard. Spelman was hard for me. Candler was hard. You just couldn't do it. And so now you're stalled. A maze could be yourself but you're struggling and you're suffering from depression and you're just trying to get back to you but you're stalled because you're having a hard time just making it day by day and getting out of the bed in the morning. And no one seems to understand because, hey, I'm a college student, or hey, I'm a preacher, or hey, I'm this and I'm that, I'm supposed to have it all together, but you can't do it, and you're stalled. Emmaus could be a graduate school or a job that you're stalled because there's rejection after rejection after rejection, and you're just trying to get there. Emmaus could be your family. You're just trying to get to them, but there's fighting and there's misunderstandings and there's bickering and you just can't seem to bring them all together. And 
you're stalled and you're stuck, just trying to get to, to them. I don't know how long it took for them to get from Jerusalem to Emmaus. That's seven miles. I know seven miles will take me several hours. Several hours. <laughs> but I know that sometimes the road to our Emmaus and our lives takes a long time. It seems to take forever. For the people in Flint, Michigan, their road to Emmaus is clean water. It's been some years. The road is long and it's hard and it's scary and the grief and disappointment and the pain seem to linger. And during those times, it's really hard to see Jesus. I can imagine that the people in Flint, they're looking for Jesus while their children are sick and they've been poisoned by the water. I can imagine that those people are like, where's my Jesus when my skin is itching or raw because I've washed in this lead-filled, poison-filled water? Where's Jesus then? But just like for these men, Jesus is there. You just can't recognize him for your pain and things that we're going through. And even then, and so I show you how Jesus is there, but just slowly revealing himself. We have a student here at Emory. He's a junior now. His name is Ruben. He is studying in South Africa this year. But in his freshman year, while his friends were going off at spring break to Panama City and Destin and Cancun, all these places we like to go because we need to rest and relax, he and a group of other students loaded up vans and they went from Atlanta to Flint, Michigan and delivered clean water. Mm. A freshman at the time. Jesus is slowly revealing himself even in the midst of their pain and their grief and that's part of our country. So if you think back and you can identify your road to Emmaus, can you identify Jesus on your road to Emmaus? Reading the text, I was like, come on, God. Like, Jesus, I need you to show them who you are now. I know when I'm going through a hard time, I need you to show up and show out. I don't need any tests. I don't need any riddles. I don't need any of these little things. I just need you. But Jesus, in his slick way, <laughs> doesn't do what we want all the time. But he reminded them, the stranger, of all that they knew, of all that they had in them, and all that they experienced with him. And Jesus does that for us, slowly reminding us. It's a lesson for us to, in the midst of our road to Emmaus, to draw on what we know, draw on how, who you know Jesus to be. For me, that's a savior, that's a redeemer, a protector, a giver of life, a provider. Who do you know Jesus to be in those good times? So you can draw on who you know Jesus to be when you're on your road to Emmaus and you're stalled. And I'm not crazy. I know that's really hard to do when you're in the midst of your stuff, in the midst of your grief. And in the midst of these disciples' grief, Jesus has the audacity to scold them. Like, they're walking and they're sad. It says they look sad. Don't you know what's just happening? And he's like, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. I can imagine they were caught off guard, like, who does this dude think he is? He don't even know who our Jesus is, and he thinks he can tell us what's going on. But I think Jesus was a little ticked off, right? They had witnessed miracles and saw his works over all this time, and they lacked faith and hope, and I can hear Jesus saying that to us today. You have the Bible, and we can debate whether people like it or don't like it, or if they find flaws on it, and who wrote it, and all this stuff, but we've got it. We've got something to pull on. You have your ancestors who've overcome. You have overcome. You've seen people receive blessings. You've received blessings. You've heard testimonies. You have them. And yet you still have a heart slow to believe that Jesus stands with you on your road to Emmaus. Don't you remember anything? Even a little thing? The disciples did, those two. Even in their grief, they remembered what Jesus had taught them. Think of others, be hospitable, care for the stranger. In Matthew 25, Jesus says a whole lot of stuff that can be confusing to a whole lot of people. But one of the things I always look at is that he's starting to talk to them and he's like giving them this information. At one point he says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me water. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And they're like, what? 
You've not, we've not done, you've not been any of those things. You've been us the whole time. What are you talking about? And they were confused and he declared, truly I tell you, just as you did this for the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. When the stranger with these two disciples was about to walk off and leave them in the dark, there were no street lights, couldn't get a signal for Uber, Right, they didn't have, it was all this stuff going on. It was scary, the martyr had stopped running. Martyr shuts down at two o'clock, the bus is earlier. He had no, he was going to walk this road. We don't know how far they had already gotten. We just know they're walking. And they say, no, they insist that the stranger come home with them for dinner. How many of you are gonna straight invite a stranger into your home for dinner? I see you, sis, I don't know how I would do it either. Really, it's a stranger. It's that homeless man on the corner who's smelling bad and really dirty, but he's hungry, and you toss him a dollar out the window, they invited him home. They had a whole conversation, and then it happened. We know that even in that, they served him first, the stranger. You know how we know it says, because they sat down to eat, and he took the bread which means they gave it to him first. He took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. They got up, and they made a seven-mile trek back to Jerusalem just to tell others what they had witnessed. It's dark again, right? But they couldn't wait. The road that was once filled with despair and grief and pain and disappointment was transformed into a road of hope and joy and witness after experiencing the resurrected Christ and the breaking of the bread. Some commentaries argue that Jesus ate with the disciples both in this story and in a, one a little bit further on because it was proof that he was real because, you know, a ghost is not going to eat with you and drink with you and hold the bread and all this. But I offer something a little different, something for us to consider. What if Jesus is reminding us that we know him when we commune with him. We know Jesus when we take time with him. When we feast on God's word, we are spending time with Jesus. John 1 tells us, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Adam Hamilton again tells us, we experience Christ's presence through others. We experience the risen Christ when we serve others. We meet the resurrected Christ when we serve strangers in need. And I would add, we meet the resurrected Christ when we are served, when we are the stranger in need and someone blesses us. When the disciples make it back to Jerusalem, they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. For the disciples, the start of experiencing the resurrected Christ was in the breaking of the bread and resulted in their witness. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to come to the table to receive communion. My prayer is that the risen Christ be made known to you in the breaking and the receiving of the bread and the wine this morning. And when we conclude, we're going to share our peace. And we're going to do it a little different. We do this here. We usually get up and we mill around and we talk to everybody. And we say, peace be with you. But I'm going to invite you to find someone you do not know, someone you did not walk in here with. And I want you to spend just a few moments sharing with that person your road to Emmaus experience and witnessing how you saw God in that moment. And if you didn't, that's okay. My prayer is that you're going to experience God and Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Basically, I'm asking you, do you know him? Now tell us how. You're welcome to the table in just a moment.